Yeah, YouTube. yeah. I'm yeah. gonna gonna first start the the broadcasting to YouTube. Okay. And admitting people. Okay. And... Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome to the virtual seminars in economic theory. Today, we are happy to, to have uh, Kai Hao Yang from Yale, who's gonna talk about distributions of posterior quantiles and economic applications. This is a joint work with Alexander Sentethis, and we have guest panelists, Piotr Worsak and Wolfgang Pressendorfer. So thank you all for, for their participation. The format as usual is a 60 minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of uh, questions at the end. Uh, we also, I mean, we, we are gonna uh, move then at that point to the virtual chair academic metaverse where we can have a more informal discussion. We will provide you with the link now and at the end of the seminar. During the talk, uh, we recommend you post your comments and questions in the Zoom chat. Alexander will try to answer your questions. And if you find it necessary, you can also unmute yourself and address the questions directly to the speaker. Uh, let me remind you that the talk is recorded. Our next talk is, is next Thursday. Uh, in that occasion, Ben Brooks from Chicago is gonna talk on the structure of informationally robust optimal mechanisms. Uh, the guest panelists are going to be Marcina Rostek and Rakesh Vavra. So, okay, thank you again. Okay, the screen is yours. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew, for the invitation and thanks everyone for coming. And uh, uh, as the introduction goes, I'm going to talk about distributions of posterior quantiles today. Uh, normally, uh, I would like to start with some motivation and economic background stories to, to fix ideas, but I'm not gonna do that today. In fact, I'm gonna start with an overview of the theoretical result. And then I'm going to go into more details about that result. And then I will give you several applications. Okay, so let me start with the overview. And is this working? Okay. Consider a one dimensional state variable called omega and suppose that it follows a CDF, can be anything. And consider a signal for that state. A signal is a joint distribution of state and signal realization such that the marginal of state equals to the prior F naught. Or equivalently, we can think of a signal as a probability measure over posteriors that average back to the prime. Now, this is a signal. So there's gonna be a bunch of signal realizations. And for each signal realization, one can apply base rule to update belief and form a posterior, which is itself a distribution over state. Right? So it's, it's an entire distribution. And, it, and therefore it has many statistics. So one can compute some of its statistics. For example, one can compute the posterior mean. And again, this is a signal. There's a bunch of signal realizations. So if you compute the posterior mean realization by realization, you end up getting a bunch of posterior means. And of course you can then ask, what's the distribution of posterior mean? We know the answer to that. Uh, H is a distribution of posterior mean under some signal if and only if H is a mean preserving contraction of the prime, right? But now let me rewind for like 10 seconds uh, to the point where I said, let's compute the mean. Well, we didn't have to compute just a the mean. There are many other statistics out there. For example, we could have computed the median, the posterior median. Take a posterior, compute its median, and ask what's the distribution of posterior median? Do we have a similar kind of characterization of that? And the purpose of this talk in this paper is to tell you that the answer is yes. And here's the answer, right? There are two distributions, upper bound F bar, upper lower bound F lower bar that depends only on the prior. And in fact, F upper bar is just a truncated prior where you throw away uh, the states that are below the prior median. And F lower bar is the, is the other truncated prior where you throw away the states that are above the prior median. And the answer to the previous question is that H is a distribution of posterior median under some signal, if and only if H belongs to this first order stochastic dominance interval. 
right? So you take any distribution H that belongs to this FOSD interval. You can, one can construct a signal such that the, the induced distribution of posterior median equals to H. And conversely, for any signal, the induced distribution of posterior median must fall in between this FOSD interval. All right, so that's the that's the result. That's the that's the main message for today. And now let me go into a little more details. The model, well, you basically saw the model. The model is the following: there's a one-dimensional state variable that has a distribution f naught, and f naught can be anything. Okay. A signal is a probability distribution over posteriors that average them back to the prime. Let me let script n be the collection of all signals. And now for each posterior, for each distribution, uh, and for any number tau, one can compute the quantile, the tau quantile of this distribution. Now, because we're playing around with all the signals, um, we can't just make assumptions saying that there's a unique quantile for each distribution. In, in some sense, uh, the, the realized posterior is, in, is endogenous here. So we have to keep track of all the quantiles. And that, that's, there, that's why it's, it's an entire interval, perhaps, because the CDF might have a flat region there. Uh, here, the uh, F inverse is the usual quantile function that one would define. And because the, the, the posteriors are, are kind of endogenous, to complete the description of the statement, I have to specify a quantile selection rule because there might be multiple quantiles sometimes. Uh, but this is this is this only this this only matters for non-generic events. So, so, so in any incident where the selection rule might matter, uh, a slight perturbation could get us out of there. But for complete but for completeness, let me still state uh, and, and introduce the notation for that selection rule but keep it with a, a smaller font, just to say that this is, this is for completion. So if, if, if this is too much, you can put that aside in, in, in your mind for, for just a second. So sorry, can I, can I ask, ask about this? So yeah. if you just let the sender, I imagine we're gonna get to some sort of design problem in a minute, a uh, Bayesian persuasion problem. If the sender could just select from the interval, yeah. would that correspond to your assumption about the selection rule or could it be potentially different? Could it depend on the objective function? So, so that, that's a good question. Depends on the objective function. The sender could want to maximize something or minimize something. And the first, the main result is a, is a characterization of the, of the visibility set. And, and so for completion, I would have to, I would have to keep track of the, the, the selection. But you're right, for specific sender receiver persuasion problem, uh, the sender gets to pick a selection rule and you, we kind of get that for free if we look at Right, and the thing you said that you know you can perturb things a little bit and get anything you want kind of suggests that you have to be careful about the selection rule to get existence in that optimization problem because if you're not careful, maybe you'll get some sort of lack of you know uh, compactness of the feasible set or something. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah right? exactly. So, so that's that's why we have to have this selection rule, and the the reason you will see in a minute what I meant when I said it's 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 non-generic, uh, and but but. We have to have the selection rule in place for the sender's problem to be always well defined. If that's that okay, so it's fully general at this point. The selection rule. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Right. It's it's fully general in the sense that it for any posterior and for any for any uh, quantile number tau, a selection rule is a mapping from from that pair to a distribution of quantiles one might select. Okay, and let me let script R. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me let script R be the collection of all the selection rules. All right, now here's the statement. Uh, for any tau, for any signal mu and selection r, let me let h tau denote the distribution of posterior tau quantiles induced by the signal and selection. And here's the formal definition. Right, and let me let uh, script h tau be the collection of all the distributions that can be induced by some signal and some selection. The goal for the for this paper is to characterize this characterize the set, and to characterize the set, let me define two important functions, uh, f lower bar and f upper bar, and they are defined formally in these ways. Uh, but essentially, f lower bar is the conditional prior, conditioning on the state being below a tau quantile of the prior. And f upper bar is the conditional prior, conditioning on the state above 
uh, a tau quantile of the prime. And note that f upper bar dominates f lower bar in the sense of first total stochastic dominance. So let me let i tau be the FOSD interval bounded by f upper bar and f lower bar. Namely, i tau is the collection of all the distributions that are dominated by f upper bar and dominates f lower bar in the sense of first order stochastic dominance. And here's the main result. For any tau, h tau equals the i tau, right? Now, let me keep these two important distributions up here, just as a reminder. Can I just ask you, follow up a little bit on the, on the selection rule? Uh, yes. So suppose, suppose you did the following. Suppose you fixed uh, a selection rule, anyone. Yep. yep, yep. And then instead of, instead of looking at h tau, you looked at the closure of h tau. The, okay, okay. The yep, closure. Yep, 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 yep. Would you get exactly the same theorem? You get exactly the same, yes. And that's the, so, that's the sense of... So it, there is a sense in which this is a useful observation because sometimes the selection rule is given by the environment, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so you yeah, have yeah. this application yeah. to, um, you know, redistricting yeah. where there is yeah. perhaps a sense that the selection rule is not up to the redistrictor, but yeah. it's given by the institution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. If, you, if, you, if you restated the theorem saying, look, I get basically the same result for any fixed selection rule, Yep. I think it's a it's perhaps a useful observation. I see. I see. Yes. Yes. That that that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, uh, we're we're right on that topic. Let me visualize this uh, theorem by showing you this picture. Uh, here I'm plotting f upper bar and f lower bar. F upper bar is in red. F lower bar is in blue. And the green dotted line is the prior. Uh, the theorem says. For any signal and for any selection, the induced distribution of posterior tau quantile must fall inside this interval, this FOSD interval, in between the red and the blue one. And conversely, if I pick any CDF in between the red and the blue one, there must exist a signal and a selection such that the induced distribution of posterior tau quantile coincides with the one that I just picked. And going back to Wolfgang's earlier question, one can think of uh, a, a slightly more, slightly stronger result as the theorem that I just stated, the closure of H tau equals to this interval, or alternatively, a, a proper notion of the interior of this FOSD interval equals to H tau for any, give, for any fixed uh, selection rule. All right. So that's the, that's the main theorem, and, and that's, the, that's the main takeaway uh, for, for today's talk. And now I, I think there might be two major kinds of questions. One is related to why this is true. The other perhaps is related to why should we care? And let me try to answer both kinds of questions separately. And let me start with uh, the question of why this is true, all right? By basically uh, giving you a quick sketch of proof, all right? And, and the proof is, the proof has two parts to show that uh, H tau is a subset of I tau, and then to show that I tau is a subset of H tau. Uh, the first part of the proof is relatively easier. So I can, uh, so, so, so I'm gonna, gonna do that first, okay? Now, to show that H tau is a subset of I tau, I will have to, oh, what I have to do is to take a signal and take any selection arbitrarily, and argue that the induced distribution of posterior tau quantile H tau is bounded in the sense of first order stochastic dominance by this F upper bar and F lower bar, right? So let me try to do that. Take this distribution and notice first that this is the distribution of posterior quantile after selection, after an arbitrary selection R. So the probability that quantiles uh, or, or below some number omega must be bounded from above by the probability that the, the smallest quantiles is, is smaller than omega. Right? And if, if we pick a selection row that always pick the smallest quantile, that must give a higher probability. And then by the definition of the quantile function, we can rewrite this inequality in this way. Right? That gives you one side of inequality. And the goal is to uh, make uh, F lower bar and upper bound in terms of point-wise dominance of, of this object, right? And then at least we establish one side of inequality. Now, how to do that then? 
Well, remember uh, mu is a signal, so it averages all the posterior back to the prime. Now these are the, I think, the only two uh, equations one should keep in mind for this talk. So let me just keep them here, all right? And if we, if we look closer at these two equations, uh, here is one observation. It's not really an observation. It's quite straightforward at this point. Um, we fixed an omega, right? This omega is arbitrary. After we fix this omega, this object, this probability, can be thought of as the, the probability that a random variable f omega is above tau, whose distribution is implied by the signal mu. And the second equality says the, the mean, the expected value of this random variable f omega must be f naught omega, All right? So if we view it this way, right? Regard f omega as a random variable that has a mean constraint, we can then ask what's the largest possible probability one can get for this kind of random variable on the event that it is above some number tau, okay? So if tau is below f dot omega, uh, I think the answer would be clear because the degenerate distribution that assigns probability one at f dot omega gives the event that f omega being above tau probability one and satisfies the mean constraint. So when tau is smaller than f dot omega, the largest possible uh, number that this probability can attain is one. Now, alternatively, if tau is above f dot omega, then the degenerate probability won't be a good idea because when tau is above f dot omega, the degenerate probability distribution assigns probability zero to the event that f omega is above tau. So in order to maximize this object, uh, as one is probably familiar with already now, that, that we just want to split uh, the prior f naught into two points, tau and zero, so that the weight of each two realization is the following. And that maximizes the probability that f omega is above tau, right? So that's the, that's the second case. And putting things together, we get that in either case, either at the probability f omega is above tau is one or it's f dot omega over tau. And so combining this with the first inequality, we get that h tau is bounded from above by this object for a fixed omega. And this object is exactly by definition f lower bar, okay? And this is true for all omega. And that tells you that the h tau in, 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 in the sense of first order stochastic dominance dominates f lower bar, right? So that's and the other side of the inequality, the, 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 the other side of the, the, the dominance result is basically the same. So I'm just gonna skip that. And that basically tells you that the, that the first part of the proof, okay? Now let me move to the second part. Now the second part of the proof is, 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 is slightly longer and, and a little more uh, complicated. And it, it, it takes basically three steps, right? Uh, it's, so what we want to do here is to show that I tau is a subset of H tau, which is basically saying, if, if I pick any distribution in the FOSD interval I tau, I have to find a signal that induces a distribution of posterior tau quantile whose, whose distribution is exactly the one I pick, okay? And the way to do that is, is in three steps. Step one, I'm gonna first identify the set of extreme points of this FOSD interval I tau, okay? And then for each extreme point, I'm gonna construct a signal and a selection uh, that induces that distribution as distribution of posterior tau quantile. And then finally, because this, is a, the, the, this interval is a convex set, we can then paste things up because any element of this interval is a mixture of the extreme points, all right? So let me start with finding the extreme point of I tau. Let me plot I tau again. Remember, this is I tau, uh, this FOSD interval uh, dominated by F upper bar and dominates F lower bar. Now you might have noticed already that this looks slightly different from the first picture that I showed you. The first picture has some curvature there. Here I'm only plotting this interval as if the prior is uniform. 
Now, this is actually without loss because all we care about is the quantile. So if the proof works for the case of uniform, then for any other prior, we can just change the coordinate and look at the quantile space and apply the same argument. Things would work out as well. All right, so this is actually not without loss to think of the prior as, as a uniform distribution. Okay, now we have this FOSD interval. What are the extreme points of the set? And the claim is the extreme point of the set um, must look like this. And anything that looks like this is an extreme point. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, uh, this kind of distribution has two threshold values, omega lower bar and omega upper bar, such that it doesn't assign any probability weights in the interval, omega upper bar and omega lower bar, right? So the CDF has to be flat here. And then outside of the interval, either the distribution coincides with the FOSD bounds, like here, like here, or it's flat, like here, on some interval. And there could be countably many intervals on which the distribution is flat. So there are a lot of this kind of distributions. You can pick arbitrary intervals, omega lower bar and omega upper bar, throw away their probability weights, and outside of this interval, you could either uh, be the same as the FOSD bounds or have flat zones, but the length of the intervals on which you're flat and the number of uh, intervals on which you're flat is all flexible. So there could potentially be countably many uh, jumps here and here, okay? And the claim is anything that looks like this is an extreme point and every extreme point must look like this. Now, the fact that any, uh, anything that looks like this is an extreme point is not that difficult to show. So I'm going to omit that for the purpose of the talk. The more important part is to show that any extreme point must look like this. And to show that, let's just consider something that doesn't look like that, right? And in particular, if we consider anything that doesn't look like the one that I just showed you, a consequence of this is that you can always find a non-degenerate rectangle, however small, but non-degenerate, in the interior of the graph of this FOSD interval. And now some of you probably know what I'm gonna do, right? Because we, we already understood pretty well what the extreme points of monotone functions uh, whose graph is in the rectangle should look like. Uh, namely, it must be a step function. Right? So within this rectangle, the function, the, the, the distribution that we just picked doesn't look like a, a graph of a step function. And that means we can split this distribution into two monotone functions whose graphs are still in this rectangle uh, into two whose, and then average back to the original one. And now because this rectangle is non-degenerate, it means that we can split the entire distribution into two who then average back to the original one. And therefore, this one is not an extreme point. So as a consequence, anything, any extreme point of this FOSD interval must look like this. Okay, so that's step one. Now going to step okay, two. So sorry to be a need to pick you about the literature, but I'm just wondering if this doesn't follow uh, from the kleiner Moldman and Strack paper, because they, they do characterize extreme points. I think the difference is they only have one bound. You have bounds on both sides. Is that the difference? So there are... There, so that's one difference. And, and another, another kind of important, but uh, exposed, it, it won't matter that much difference is that they look at majorization order. And so if we have to transform things in this setting to majorization order, the, there is an underlying assumption that the density uh, is, there. For, first of all, density exists, and then density is monotone. Uh, so ex ante, it's not obvious, but ex post, if you look at the structure, it looks pretty similar to uh, to the extreme point characterized by uh, Kleiner, Motovanu, and, and Streck. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now that was the first step. Now going to the second. Um, now I'm going to argue that for any extreme point of this interval I tau, which by the way looks like this, I can construct a signal and a selection such that the induced distribution of posterior tau quantile looks exactly like this. Okay. Now, remember I said the, um, even though 
we've characterized the extreme point, there are still a lot of extreme points, especially that there, there could be countably many jumps here and here. And it's complicating things and it, it makes it harder to see through what really we'd want to do. So let me just focus on a particular class of extreme points where I just throw away all the jumps. All right, suppose that we're looking at this kind of extreme points that either is flat on the interval at omega lower bar, omega upper bar, or is the same, uh, coincides with the FOSD bounds. Okay, and now I want to construct a signal that induces a distribution of posterior tau quantiles that looks like this. Okay, now let me plot this interval here uh, as an auxiliary graph. The idea of constructing a distribution of posterior tau quantile that looks like this, one necessary condition for it is that if we look closer, on the interval uh, from zero to omega lower bar, which is the, the, the tail interval here, we want the distribution of posterior tau quantile, tau quantile to be proportional to the prior because that's how the FOSD lower bound is defined. And uh, a consequence of this is that basically for any state below omega lower bar, we want that state to be always picked as a posterior tau quantile in the posterior they belong to. Right? The same four states above omega upper bar. Now, it might be a little bit tempting to think, oh, maybe I can just consider the fully revealing signal because that perfectly separates all the states and each state would be, uh, would be a posterior tau quantile uh, for, for, for the posterior they belong to. Right? But it turns out that's not a good idea because it, when we perfectly separate states, for states that are in between this interval omega lower bar and omega upper bar, they are necessarily going to be a tau quantile of the, of the distribution they belong to, and they, they will be picked. And, then, and therefore there will be positive probability weights assigned to those states as uh, in the entire distribution of posterior tau quantiles. And we don't want that. We want a distribution that assigns probability zero on the interval omega lower bar and omega upper bar, right? So the way to get rid of those is to basically, we still wanna separate states that are below omega lower bar and omega upper bar and above omega upper bar, sorry. But at the same time, we want to pull every state in between in a way such that they won't get picked. And the way, one way to do this is to pull all the states in between uniformly with each one of the separated states either below or above. Okay, now let me be more precise. Let's, uh, let, let's give this part uh, another color, gray. So now we have four areas. The gray area, the uh, blue area, the red area, and the black area. Now, the, the way to construct the signal is basically, we first look at states in the gray and the red area, and we want to separate states in the gray area. And at the same time, pull all of the states in the red area uniformly with, the separate, with each of the separated states below, right? And similarly, we want to separate states in the black area, and pull uniformly every state in the blue area with each one of the separated states above. Let me be more precise about it and just move this here and introduce another picture. Basically, I can first split the prior into two conditional priors, one conditioning on the gray and the red area, the other conditioning on the blue and the black area. If I can then split those two priors into several posteriors, where each of the state below omega lower bar or above omega upper bar becomes a posterior tau quantile and none of the states in between is a posterior tau quantile. And then an average back to the conditional priors, then we're done, All right? So let me start with the first conditional prior, conditioning on the gray and the red uh, interval, All right? So let me plot this prior. It basically looks like this, it's a conditional prior. And note that, uh, by construction, tau is a uh, omega lower, everything from omega lower bar to the prior tau quantile is a tau quantile of this conditional prior, All right? And now consider any state below omega lower bar, All right? 
Now I want to construct a posterior that contains omega lower bar, such that omega lower bar is a tau quantile. And here's how to do it. Here's a, at least one way to do it is to construct a posterior that looks exactly the same as this conditional prior all the way to omega lower bar and then assigns all the, prob all the remaining probability weights to that state omega. Right, that then by construction, omega is a tau quantile of this posterior. And note that omega is, is arbitrary. So I can do the same thing for all the omegas below. And after that, I get a bunch of posteriors. And for each one of the posterior, the omega is exactly a tau quantile. And they average back to the conditional prior. Now, similarly, we can look at the other conditional prior, condition on the blue and the black interval. Look at this conditional prior. Take any state above omega upper bar. I'm going to construct a posterior that looks the same as the conditional prior all the way until omega upper bar. And, and then oh, wait, disappeared. My apologies. Uh, okay, my apologies. And then assigns all the probability weight on um, the state omega. And then I can do the same thing to all the omegas. I got a bunch of posteriors. Each one in each one of these posteriors, omega is a tau quantile, and they average back to the conditional prior. Okay, and that means I can construct a signal with proper selection that induces distribution of posterior tau quantiles that look like this. All right. Now let's bring back the jumps. Now at this point, after I bring back the jumps. It might be a little clearer how to deal with the jumps because the way the jumps are structured is basically saying that I want to pull all of the state in the interval of jump to the one that's closest to the uh, prior tau quantile, right? And the, the previous construction gives us for each omega below omega lower bar and above omega upper bar, some posterior where that omega is exactly a tau quantile of that posterior. Uh, the way to deal with jumps is basically to, to pull those posterior together and make it a pool posterior. And once we do that, exactly the omega that's closest to uh, the prior tau quantile is going to be a posterior tau quantile in the pool posterior. And that deals with the jumps, okay? So that's, that's step two. That shows you basically for any extreme point of this FOSD interval, we can construct a signal and a selection that induces a distribution of posterior tau quantile that looks like this. So the last step is to, is to close the model, paste things up, uh, just to be a slightly more formal about it. For any signal and for any uh, selection, they induce a joint distribution of state and posterior such that with probability one, state is a, the state is a, is, a post, is a tau quantile of that posterior. Namely, this is suggesting that uh, H tau as a function of the pair mu tau is affine in mu tau, okay? And so now we know uh, for any H in the FOSD interval I tau, because I tau is a convex set, H can be expressed as the, a mixture of extreme points and we know that every extreme point can be, can be attained uh, by some signal and selection mu r. And this, this function that maps from mu r to h tau is affine. So that means for any h in i tau, we can indeed find a signal and selection that induce h as a distribution of posterior tau quantile. Okay, so that's, the, that's the, the first why question, why this is true, basically. And for the second part of this talk, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about some applications. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get through all these three applications, uh, redistricting and gerrymandering, and Bayesian persuasion and, and information design and some econometrics, okay? Uh, and, and, and hopefully that could answer part of the question of why should we care? Right, let's start with gerrymandering. Uh, gerrymandering is essentially uh, drawing electoral districts to, to group voters into different districts, and then each district elect their own representatives. All right, so consider the following model. 
Considering the following world where there's a continuum of citizens with single peak preferences over a one dimensional space. Okay, and, and citizens ideal positions are denoted uh, by omega. And suppose that the ideal positions are distributed according to a prior F naught. Okay. Before I was calling mu a signal for the state, in this particular setting, there's, a, there's another interpretation of mu, right? Because basically mu is a way to split F naught into several distributions that, that then aggregate back to the, 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 the population distribution F naught. So we can think of this as a district map that splits the population into several districts where each one of the districts is denoted by F that's exactly the distribution of voters' ideal positions within that district. And then every district aggregate back to the uh, population distribution if not. Okay. And then let's suppose that for each district, the citizens are going to elect a representative for that district. Let's assume that the election adheres to the median voter property uh, so that the ideal position of the elect elected representative of district F is, must be a median of F, okay? And again, F is kind of uh, endogenous here, so there might be ties. Uh, let's denote a tie-breaking rule as a selection rule R. Okay? Now in this setting, one can ask the following question, which is given that there might be a map that split the population distribution into several districts and then each district elected representative, what are the possible scenarios? What are the possible compositions of the Congress or the collection of representatives that can possibly be induced by some district maps? All right, in other words, what are the limits of gerrymandering? Right, what's the set of possible composition of the Congress, which, which is formally defined as the distribution of the representative's ideal position that can be induced by a map, right? And our main characterization answers that question because remember the main theorem says for any tau h tau equals to i tau, in this setting, we can pick tau equals to a half and the prior is F dot. So the answer is uh, the, the, the collection of all possible induced distribution of posterior tau quantile, which uh, translates to this environment, the, the collection of all possible composition of the Congress ranges from F lower bar a half to F upper bar a half. And what is F lower bar a half here? Remember F lower bar a half is a truncated prior where we just throw away the states that are above the prior median and put it into the, the language of, of this model. Uh, F lower bar a half can be thought of as a Congress that only represents citizens whose ideal positions are on the left of the population media. So in some sense, that's an all left Congress. And similarly, F upper bar is an all right Congress that only represents population, uh, that only represents citizens whose ideal positions are on the right of the population media. Right? So the answer to what are the limits of gerrymandering is according to the main characterization, uh, the composition of the Congress can range all the way from the all left Congress to the all right Congress. And anything in between is possible. Okay. Now, so can, can I ask you something about the yeah. gerrymandering application? So, yeah. so in, in this particular application, it would be really nice to have some handle on how you could incorporate constraints on the, on the, on the set yes. script then, yes. right? Yes. Because in gerrymandering, you often have it's it's sort of a little bit implausible that you that you can literally um, do any uh, right. distribution of, of of districts that is right. sort of right. okay. Yeah. Have you thought about that? So yeah, we we've thought about uh, a little bit about that, uh, and actually that's a, that, that's another ongoing project of ours. Uh, but uh, I think I think you're right. This result is by no means we're claiming that this is the this is the practical. This is the this is the reality. We're, we're not claiming that. This is this is the limits of gerrymandering, the theoretical bounds uh, of what can happen. Um, we do have several extensions, if you want to call, uh, that incorporates. Say, for example, if you can have only finitely many districts, 
Uh, mm -hmm. If there are states, which is basically uh, a, a presupposed ways to split uh, the, 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 the population distributions. And then we go to geography and look at how, whether, whether or not can we really generate this kind of uh, distribution on a physical map, which is a, which is a two dimensional set. Now, if we look at the two dimensional set without any other topological constraint and think of voters uh, as, you know, think, think of one point in the two dimensional set as the, uh, the geography coordination and, and think of voters ideal position as, a, as, as the range of a mapping that map from geographical location to the ideal position, right? Now, if this mapping is non-degenerate in some sense, in the sense that it has, it has non-degenerate indifference curves, uh, the level curve of the of the mapping from uh, geographical location to ideal positions is uh, has non-degenerate indifference curves in the sense that they don't collapse to just one point. Then we can construct uh, a partition of that geographical space to induce distribution of posteriors that average back to the prior. But I guess the core to this question is what if we have uh, more practical topological constraints, say contiguity or convexity even uh, of each district that we draw, then it really depends on the, the nature of the distribution. Uh, and and we're, we're working on something uh, that, uh, that would, that would we're, we're working on something in that direction. Uh, but so far, what we can do is, is this, this more, uh, more, broader version where we can, where, where basically we can draw a lot of maps that may not look legal uh, under current US election law. I mean, I guess I, uh, one thing you said earlier would be one very simple way to handle it. You can, you can sort of divide uh, your distribution into, as you said, you call them states, right? right. And so, and, and, and then you can, you can sort of gerrymander those, those sub distributions, but in some sense yeah. that imposes more constraints. Yep, that imposes yep, yep, yep. constraints by itself. And, yep. uh, you know, in some yep. sense, you maybe you can get a long way incorporating realistic constraints by just doing that. Oh, yeah, that, that um, we can do. Uh, but the characterization is less cleaner. It, it involves uh, one, one slight existent uh, quantifier in the statement of the theorem. Uh, but, but qualitatively, the characterization has, the, has a similar spirit. It's not everything. Uh, but but we can have a characterization of the set of possibilities, but that that characterization still has an existence quantifier in the statement, which uh, me personally don't think it's perfect. Okay, all right. Uh, so that's that's one part. And now, since we have the entire characterization of the distribution or a composition of the Congress, we can then ask what are the possible outcomes that can be enacted. So if we are willing to make further assumptions of how Congress make decisions, uh, for example, here we assume that the Congress also selects the median uh, among the Congress persons to enact that person's ideal position as the final policy and call omega that, that, that uh, the set of possible policies that can be enacted or set of possible legislative outcomes that can be enacted. As a corollary of the main characterization, omega equals to uh, the interquartile range under the population distribution. So anything ranges from the population of 25th percentile to the population of 30, uh, 75th percentile can be possibly induced by some map, right? And, and the proof is, is quite simple once we have the full characterization. Remember the characterization says the distribution, the composition of the Congress must be a, a CDF that lies in between the blue and the red one. Here's a half. And the, way, the reason why it's a half is, the, is because the Congress also enacts the median of the representatives. You map it down, you get exactly this interval. So uh, for any number in this interval, one can draw a distribution that crosses a half at that point. Right? And, and therefore there exists a map that induces this outcome. Okay, and one corollary to this corollary is that when the population distribution becomes more polarized, 
maybe you can think of this as uh, having a, a more quasi-convex density, for example, this interval is going to expand. Right? So, so more polarized po uh, population is going to lead to a larger set of possible outcomes that can be enacted. All right? And uh, in, in addition to giving the characterization of the composition of the Congress and, and characterization of the set of possible outcomes that can be enacted, the main characterization also gives you a way to study the sort of optimal gerrymandering problem uh, in a specific setting. Right, so consider a slightly different model. Right? Instead of asking what's the possible composition of the Congress, we can consider a mo model where there's a map drawer and there are two parties and there's an aggregate preference shock among the population. The aggregate preference shock works in the following way. If the realization of this shock is X, then citizen with idea position omega votes for party one if and only if omega is above X. So you can think of this as a, as a um, um, translation shock to the entire distribution of idea positions. That's why it's called aggregate. Here we don't have individual shock, right? So once we know the aggregate shock, we know perfectly how the voter is going to vote, right? And, and because of this, party one is going to win a district F if and only if F is below the, uh, the largest median uh, of, this, of that district. Now here, this is assuming that tie is broken in favor of party one, okay? Now consider a map drawer whose objective is W, which is a function of the composition of the Congress. Now, because there are only two parties, it's just a, it's just a function of the party one seat share. Okay, and so the map drawer's problem is basically to choose a signal and, and, and a selection to maximize W, which is this, right? Choosing a signal and potentially a selection to maximize W of probability of winning, party one winning and aggregating everything using the aggregate shock. Now this looks like a complicated problem because now we have to understand how signal translates to distribution of posterior medians. But because we, because we have a characterization, we know we can just scratch it and write down a simpler problem where the map drawer basically chooses a distribution in the FOSD interval to maximize W of one minus H. If W is increasing, then essentially we're just maximizing one minus H in the sense of first order stochastic dominance. And that coincides with the optimal map, uh, uh, one of the benchmark in, of, of optimal maps in uh, 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 Claude Tillian and Walitsky, who also studies the optimal gerrymandering problem. And it also coincides with the a perfect information limit of uh, Friedman and Holden, who also studies this kind of optimal districting problem. It doesn't coincide to any solution of Wolfgang's, oh, Wolfgang's paper, unfortunately, because the noise is a lot bigger and, and the individual noises, it plays, plays a, a, an important role there. But since now we have an entire characterization of the feasible set, we can generalize in another direction, which is the, the function W, right? Now we can basically look at any function W because this is a pretty nice set. I is a pretty nice set, it's convex, it's a lattice, and we know the extreme point of this set already. Right, so for example, if W is, is something that's non-monotonic, for example, if the map drawer is a bipartisan committee who commits to maximize balance of power in the Congress, then the following H star is going to be optimal. In case you're wondering, H star looks like this. Okay, all right. So that's the, that's the first application. Now let me move to the second. Uh, can I ask you a quick question about this, about the selection rule again? So I, I think, uh, based on what Wolfgang said before and this com this conversation we had, it, it seems like this result will survive even if you have an adversary choose the selection rule, which kind of seems to make economic sense that maybe if things are fragile, you want to be kind of pessimistic. So is it true that you would get the same result if the selection rule is, is picked adversarially? Uh, I, I, think, I think it goes back to your earlier question. Sometimes it may fail the upper semi-continuity property of the designer's problem. Uh, we can look at the supremum or the infimum of that problem, no problem, and then we will have no problem, 
So in terms of the bounds on the like probabilities of is is going to they're going to be the same. It's just that you cannot actually achieve these bounds yes. precisely. You have to, you yes. can only you cannot do that precisely with 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 epsilon deviation uh, as what as what people often do. Then then we can do that no problem. Right. Thank you. That's a that's a good point. Okay. Now second application based in persuasion, and I think. It, it's, it's safe to assume that uh, uh, many of the audience know Bayesian persuasion and what Bayesian persuasion is about. So I'm just going to do a real quick review uh, because of time. There's a sender, there's a receiver, there's a state. Sender wants to communicate information about the state to the receiver. The receiver is going to take an optimal action after updating belief and form a posterior. Sender can commit to a signal and sender wants to maximize payoff. Right? Because the sender moves first, sender essentially gets to pick uh, the sender preferred receiver optimal action given each posterior. Right? And we, we kind of know this problem, and we know that this problem can be solved in, in the principle of concavifying the sender's objective function. But we also know that concavifying uh, a function, uh, especially a multivariate function, let alone a, an infinite dimensional functional when the support of F naught is infinite is hard, right? Uh, and so there, there, so analytical solutions for this general persuasion problem is known to be kind of a challenging, challenging model to solve. Uh, fortunately, if we look at a special case where the preferences are such that only the posterior mean matters for the sender, I mean, Piotr has a beautiful paper about it. And I think uh, Piotr and Wolfgang and, and myself, and I think many uh, of you in the audience may have at least one or two paper that solves the persuasion problem under that assumption. Okay. The characterization allows us to complement that setting, saying and because we can then we can now say that now instead of having preferences such that um, only thing that matters is the posterior mean, we can now solve problems where only th everything that matters is the posterior median or, or quantile, All right? So let's assume that preferences are such that the, the sender only cares about a posterior tau quantile. Then we can write the problem into this, right? choosing a distribution in the interval I tau to maximize the sender's objective. Again, I tau is a nice set, it's convex, it's a lattice, it's compact, and we know the extreme point. Plus, this, this problem is linear, right? So we know the extreme point of a linear constraint maximization problem. We, we basically know uh, a lot about the st structure of the solution already. Okay. Now I can vis revisit uh, the two classical examples in, in Kamenica and Jensko, lobbying and, and supplying product information to demonstrate how this works. Um, for example, in the lobbying example, uh, the, in, in Comerza Jensko, they consider uh, a sender who's a lobbyist and receiver who's a politician. The lobbyist wants to induce some action of the receiver, and the receiver wants to minimize the loss between the action taken and the true state. There, they assume that the loss function is quadratic. Here, I can replace quadratic loss function with the absolute loss function. Or, or any rotation of the absolute loss function. Right? But under absolute loss function, for each posterior, the receiver's optimal action is the median. Right? It's, it's one median. And therefore, the sender's problem is exactly this, choosing a distribution in I, a half, to maximize objective. Right? So if V is increasing, we know the upper bound is optimal. If V is decreasing, we know the lower bound is optimal. Again, if V is something else arbitrary, for example, there's an ideal action that the sender wants to induce, H double star is optimal. And in case you're wondering, H double star looks like this, right? And in general, we know, that we know how to characterize the solution to this problem again, because it's a linear problem and we know the extreme point of the set. All right. Now, uh, another example in Kamenica Jensko okay, is. Can I interrupt? Sorry. Uh, so I can see how the actual valley corresponds to the median. Could you just generate the class of utilities for the receiver so that it corresponds to the all the tile quantiles? Should we yep, possible, yeah, right? yep, we could. And that's uh, basically we can replace the absolute loss with 
the, the test function that econometricians use in computing quantile regression, which we're gonna see in maybe three minutes. Okay. I, can, uh, can I ask something else about that? I mean, there, there, there's kind of a, a sense uh, from your results that you can manipulate the median or uh, much more than you could manipulate the mean. I don't know if this really makes sense, but the question is whether there is a, a sort of, you know, whether there's a way to say this more precisely. Um, no, that's a, that's a good point. Um, right, your, your results show there's just so much room to manipulate, for example, the median. Uh, right. You know, there is no law of iterated medians. Um, and so, so you would think that, um, you know, optimal persuasion has just a lot more room if people yes. care about the median rather than the mean. Yes. It's yes. just not clear to me how to say that, uh, yes. to make that statement precise. Well, that, that's, that's, that's a good point. And uh, you can ask for the center's utility as you vary. So the, 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 the receiver is going to be targeting the, some ideal point and it can target it using a quadratic loss or an absolute yep. loss. Yeah. And what happens to the center's utility? That's one way to capture this. Yeah. If you get more flexibility, the center should be better off when the receiver is using the absolute value. I think right. it's a great, great suggestion. Right. Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. That's a good point. At least we can, we can go back to this lobbying or a more general, uh, more general setting where the center has state independent preferences and the receiver wants to minimize loss. And we compare the absolute loss or generalized absolute loss, uh, the center's value uh, in, in that problem with standards uh, value in a quadratic loss problem. And that, that's, that, that's one way to do it. Uh, but, but in general, I think that's a, that's a good question. Uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep in mind and, and, and try to think about that. All right, now in, in another example that, that relates to Bayesian persuasion is supplying product information. But I think uh, many of you have got the idea that, that we can apply this in, 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 uh, into problems that, that complement or, or generalize the existing persuasion problems. So I'm going, I'm going to skip that part for uh, the sake of time and move to um, another model that talks about market segmentation in a two-sided market. Right? Consider a platform called a ride share app, say Uber, who operates in the two-sided market there is a unit mass of buyers, riders on one side of the market with unit demand whose willingness to pay are distributed according to F0. And there is a tau mass of sellers who have inelastic supply, but unit supply, okay? Now suppose that this ride share app can segment both sides of the market and, and match one side with the other. So that each segment consists of a subset of buyers and sellers and the price of each segment is determined by the market clearing condition, right? Now, it, there, there, there may be many practical constraints of what the platform can do, how the platform can segment consumers. Perhaps one practical constraint is that the thickness of the market, uh, it, it would be ideal of the thick, for the thickness of the market to, to be fixed. So the ratio of the demand and supply must be tau in each segment. Because under this thickness constraint, every consumer will be waiting in the same time for the same time duration for them to get a match. It's a different story whether they want to take a ride because that depends on the price, but at least for maybe fairness constraint, uh, one might want the thickness of the market to be the same for, for each segment. Right? Now in this setting, what can we say about, right? Uh, first of all, can we really verify compliance to the thickness constraint? Right? Because to verify compliance to the thickness, one has to observe demand and supply in each market segment. And that's sometimes something that, that's only known by the platform. Or does the platform have incentive to violate that? We don't know. Can we verify that? We don't know yet. Uh, or more generally, what market segmentation maximizes revenue? What market segmentation is the most efficient? What maximizes rider surplus? our characterization gives way to answer those questions. Uh, first, note that we can regard mu as a market segmentation in this setting, because mu is a way to split the demand side. You take in the thickness constraint that pins down the size of the supply as well. And for any segment F, the thickness constraint plus the market clearing uh, condition implies that the, the price in that segment must be a one minus tau quantile of that market segment. 
Now we have a characterization of distribution of tau quantiles, which in this setting is the distribution of price. So price distribution must be a subset of I tau. I one minus tau is a typo, sorry. Right? And, and so the, the, um, the, the, the question, the answer to the question of how can we verify adherence to the thickness constraint, uh, one answer is to look at price distribution. If you see a price distribution that falls outside of this FOSD interval, it means that it must not have been coming from a segmentation that satisfied the thickness constraint. All right, more generally, we can characterize the feasible outcomes, uh, the pair of average price and total surplus. And, and here's the formal statement, but it's clear to show that in the picture, right? The, 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 the picture looks like this. The, this triangle where the horizontal axis is average price, vertical axis is total surplus, is the set of possible uh, outcome that can be induced, which can then be translated into a division of surplus. Uh, the the a vertical a vertical axis is total revenue, horizontal axis is writer surplus. So for example, if you're interested in maximizing revenue, you pick this point. If you're interested in maximizing surplus, you pick this point. And for any other different objectives, you know where to do, you know where to pick. Okay. Now finally, the last application, which I think I have two, three minutes to it, um, is econometrics. Right now, let me quickly go over that application, which is basically about quantile regression. Right now, consider a, a classical setting for quantile regression. We have an IID drawn random sample x i y i. Sometimes economists are interested in estimating the tau quantile of the conditional distribution of y given x, and that's a function of x. Call that g tau. For simplicity, economists often assume. Uh, impose some parametric assumptions to this function g, for example, linear, right? So that's, that's the standard linear quantile regression, and which may be a correct model, which may not be a correct model. We, we don't know. We as econometricians, we don't know, but we can go ahead and, and estimate that beta. Regardless of whether that, that model is correct, eventually we're going to have an estimate of beta star who minimizes uh, the exact expected loss under this loss function rho tau, which is the test function that goes back to uh, Piotr's earlier question, generalized uh, absolute loss function. And now one can then go back to ask, is the model really correct? All right. Suppose that we know the marginal of y or that we can estimate the marginal of y, then there is a way to test whether the model is right. Because you can get a consistent estimation of beta star. And according to our characterization, the distribution of x prime beta star must fall into the FOSD interval I tau. So a model misspecification test tells you that if you, if you see some distribution of posterior quantile x prime beta star that doesn't belong to I tau in statistical sense, then you can reject the null hypothesis that your model is right. And the benefit of this test is that all we need to know is the margin of y. Now, for the uh, model misspecification test out there, usually one has to estimate the, the entire joint distribution of x and y, which can sometimes be, be, uh, be computationally challenging, especially when some cells have uh, very few, day, few observations. A benefit of this test is that we only need to know the marginal. But of course, there's a downside. The, the test is not asymptotically powerful uh, because one may not be able to reject the null hypothesis even if you have infinite data, right? But we can do one step further uh, by looking at cases where we only care about one covariance. Suppose that K equals to one, and suppose that we know the marginal of X and the marginal of Y, but for some reason, we don't know the joint. I right, suppose that uh, y is wage, x, y is years of schooling, but they probably are coming from different data sets. And we're interested in g tau. For, for example, when tau equals to 0 0.1, then we're interested in the top 1% of income earners as a function of years of schooling. But we have crappy data set. They come from different two data sets. We can't combine those data. Can we say anything about g in this case? The answer is yes, if we are willing to assume that g tau is increasing, 
Then according to the main characterization, we have a complete characterization of the identification set of GCAP. Right? And that this is the this is in a similar spirit of giving marginal. Can we say anything about the joint? I, I saw uh, Mac is in the audience. So it's in the similar spirit, but one special thing here is that we focus on quantile and according to, and therefore according to the characterization that's that's only about quantiles, we can we can say uh, quite a lot about the, this kind of characterization of joint. And that 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 also generates. Uh, several existing results in econometrics. So I'm just gonna show that here as a, uh, as, as a showcase. And I think I'm just going to end here. Right. Here, here are my conclusion and, and, and discussion slides. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for your talk, Kai. It was, it was very nice. So we now open the, the, the Q&A session. So panelists, uh, you can start. I don't know. I mean, uh, Wolfgang, perhaps. Do you have any final comment or any final question? I don't really have anything. So <laughs> feel free to open it up. You there? Uh, I have one quick question. And uh, beautiful paper, by the way. Uh, I think one of the highest praises to say that I wish I had come up with this myself. Um, I was just wondering if you uh, if you have any thoughts on what if the if you want to characterize uh, distributions of several quantiles, joint distributions, is this doable? Is it very hard? Uh, that's my ideal. That's that's our ideal next step, and I'm not sure if it's hard or simple. Uh, we're just basically stuck. <laughs> because here it's one dimensional. So, so a lot of the things is easier if it's one dimensional and a lot harder if it's two dimensional. Um, so we're, we're kind of stuck on that, but I do think we can say something about that, uh, but I, I, I don't have much to say at this moment. Thank you. Good, so any question from the audience? So just unmute yourself if you have any question. I mean, in the meanwhile, I, I have a, a very little comment myself. Okay, so it's not really a question. So, I mean, um, beyond, I mean, the, the theoretical um, um, model, I mean, maybe what it is interesting is the amount of application that can be drawn from the theoretical model, no? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to understand, I mean, uh, what is the, the you know the general setting no i mean beyond uh, be, beyond distributions and, and quantiles so it's kind of you start from a prior which is basically like a distribution of resources mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and you can group your resources the way you want yep. okay and yep. and the outcome of how you group the resources is going to depend on on, a, on on basically quantile of your resources in each of the group, uh, yep. Yep. group. Yep. Yep. Groups, right so that's the general problem which by the way sounds like a like a you know i mean like a very general economic problem no and probably that's the reason why you're you can come up with so many applications right. one that crossed my mind no that that seems to be related to, to this thing of aggrupating resources and then that the outcome may depend on well particular and a functional depends on the quantile of each of the group resources is this family of games that are called the coronal blotos game Okay, it's, it's a very different setting, mostly because if I remember it right, it's with homogeneous resources, whereas in your case, you have heterogeneous resources. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering whether there is something that can be said to that literature that I remember was kind of, uh, you know, a very wide literature for some time, yeah. I see. So you see, I mean, uh, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not sure about what is the outcome function that one can think of in a relevant example of the Colonel Blotos game. No, but, but for instance, you can think that you have an army, okay? You have a distribution of resources, you can group it the way you like, okay? And then send to different, to different places to attack your rival, okay? That was more or less the setting of the Colonel Blotto game. Well, yeah. Okay. I see. And, and, uh, I see. So I mean, if you put more resources than your rival, you win. Which I'm not sure, but it sounds like it's a quantile problem, isn't it? I see. Well. Okay, that that might be a very nice application. We've never thought about that, partly because of my lack of, uh, my 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 personal lack of knowledge to to that literature. Uh, but that's a very good point. We should we should look into that and. and Thank you very much.
Uh, but but I think you're right. In general, you can think of the the gerrymandering problem, the the, the platform problem, uh, and, and some of the persuasion problems as as a general setting where you want to allocate uh, state or resources into groups. So there, there are a couple of attempts that when we when we try to come up with applications, uh, say for example, um, the uh, the group matching problems. Like you have a school, you want to assign students into classroom, and you care about the median performance of, of each class. That's one example, uh, and uh, you know for for. Um, Another example could be related to inequality and, and segregation. And you, you care about top percentile of, or bottom percentile of, of income earners. And, and uh, you, you want to understand how segregation affected, right? Or, and here are some, some other applications that I, I didn't have time to talk about. In, in finance, there is this value at risk measure that measures the mm -hmm. uh, top five, per, top uh, bottom 5% of the worst case of an asset, the return of an asset. And there is an analogous definition of co-VAR uh, that measures the co-dependence of one financial institution on the other, which is basically a conditional uh, value at risk, a posterior quanta, if you like. So the characterization gives you a bound on the possible co-VARs that, that, can, that can happen out there. Uh, so I think the general direction that, that that we're trying to we're trying to go to when when finding ex, uh, examples and applications is is exactly what you said uh you, you have some resources you want to allocate it and somehow the the outcomes is is determined by the quantile of each group uh, but we're, yes. we're definitely looking into that literature thank you yeah, yeah thank you yeah any other question Okay, so it's almost time. So any other final question maybe? So in that case, maybe, yes? I, I mean, I, I could also ask this in, in the later session, but kind of follow up on, on this, I and, and led to my previous question. Is it feasible at all to characterize joint distributions of posterior means and a quantile? Because you can, like, when you look at these finance applications, maybe what you care about is like, the average return of your portfolio and then the value at risk. Yeah. Is it at all like, is there any compatibility between these two approaches? And this is how you presented the model. Like we have this posterior mean model, which is tractable. Now we have your model, which is tractable. Is there any way to combine them in one characterization? That's, that's also another good question. And actually uh, we, we tried a little bit uh, of characterizing two quantiles, the joint distribution of two quantiles at the same time. We tried a little bit of characterizing the distribution of quantile, joint distribution of quantile and state at the same time. We actually have never tried joint distribution of posterior quantile and mean at the same time. So, so maybe maybe that's that's another way to look into. Uh, thank you, thank you. That's a very good point. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody, for I mean, and in particular, Kaid, co-author, and the panelists. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, now, I mean, we are going to finish the, the formal part of the of the seminar, and uh, we can move to this uh, virtual chair. I'm going to put the link for you in the in the chat. Okay, and uh, well, I mean, I hope to see you there. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.